Uh, hey everybody, this is Aaron Voigt. Um, this is a bit of a different video today. Uh, I'm I'm making a what is basically a little uh, RPG video essays 101 guide. Um, I posted recently on Blue Sky, uh, offering to give some tips to anybody who is interested in making RPG video essays, and that got a lot of response. So I figured I'd throw together a quick guide uh, and make that available to everybody here. Um, all of the resources in this presentation will be available in the video description. But I just wanted to give people the opportunity to, uh, you know, see what my process is like. You know, big disclaimer up front, I doubt this will work for everybody. But this process is hopefully going to give you an idea of what it looks like when I make a video essay and um, walk you through how you might be able to, to do something similar. So firstly, you know, why make video essays about RPGs? Well, firstly, it's fun. It's, you know, part of the hobby. You know, I'm, I don't broadly consider myself an incredible game designer. Uh, so this is my way to get involved in the hobby. Um, you know, and, and, you know, honestly, I started doing it because I thought it would help me become a better game designer by reading more games. And now I think that this is probably a little bit more direct way to, to help other designers, right? It also highlights new and interesting folks, um, especially in the indie RPG scene where we're working with numbers of people that are probably, you know, like if somebody gets 80 downloads, that's a huge deal, right? We're looking with very small numbers here and uh, making video essays and, and small videos about that uh, really helps to, um, you know, boost their profile, right? Um, you know, it, it is a form of marketing. I kind of consider myself a marketer in that way. Um, so it, it's nice to help out uh, and build the community in that way. Um, it also helps build your own writing and critical taste. Uh, and what I mean by that is like, it, it is a way for me to practice how I view various subjects. It helps me, you know, expand my, my reading. Uh, you know, it forces me to read things and bring in additional context so I can provide that context to uh, a specific work. Um, you know, I had never, you know, read Moby Dick before I covered uh, Hell Whalers, and I still haven't read Moby Dick technically. Um, but I had to watch the uh, the movie of Moby Dick, um, and that was really interesting, and I'm glad I did. So it, it kind of helps you become uh, more more broadly read and and interesting as a person, which I think is neat. Uh, and you know, the last bit of this is like I I want to watch more video essays. You know, if I may be cocky, I think I'm among the best video essayists in the indie RPG scene. You know, that's that's a very small number of people, but I think I'm pretty darn good at this. Um, but I'm willing to bet that if more people got in on this, I would not be the best, and that's actually ideal for the ecosystem that I hope we build. So um, if anybody uh, out here wants to come and take this throne, uh, I'd be actually thrilled. So um, let's uh, let's see what my process looks like and hopefully get some, uh, some Kingslayers uh, started. So firstly, I think video essays are a different type of work than a, than a video review. There's a lot of RPG reviewers out there, um, and they're doing a great and valuable service. Um, but there's, there's a little bit of, um, you know, it's different, right? Uh, you know, firstly, you know, video essays have a thesis, right? Um, so, for for instance, you know, you're you're targeting in a spe specific part of a game, or trying to bring a game, an idea from a game into a, a wider context. Um, you know, uh, when I'm thinking about like my my Mouse Ritter uh, video, right? That's um, you know, Mouse Ritter is about the experience of the terror of being small, right? And and if I start with that central idea and broaden that out and, and add additional context, um, that's that's kind of why that thesis is there. Um, and also, you know, that adding additional context is, is what makes video essays interesting, right? You bring in additional works to, to make comparative, um, you know, arguments. I think this is a really important bit. Uh, Thomas Manuel actually pointed this out to me, but like, because, um, RPGs, like, especially if you're old, you haven't played them, which, you know, I, I very rarely do play the games I talk about. Um, if you haven't played them, you know, you're going to need another experience to, to compare it to, right? And especially because RPGs are so subjective, you know, two people can, can use the same game and have wildly different experiences at the table. Um, so having a comparative text or piece um, to work off of really is what makes uh, video essays interesting, in my opinion. Um, Another thing about um, video essays is that they're not really about quality, I don't think. It's not saying, oh, you know, I like this this game because it has, you know, beautiful art or the rules are really tight or it's really easy to run. And, you know, you can certainly bring in all of those aspects. Um, but I think that it's more interesting if you are not super focused on, like, whether or not a game is quote-unquote good or not. I broadly think that that's not a useful way to, to think about games. Um, so that that's why I think video essays are are in some ways more interesting than reviews because they're not trying to tell the consumer, you know, what to buy or what to, you know, think about a game, but rather trying to get whoever's watching the video to think about a certain subject in a different way. Um, video essays are also, you know, much more personal, right? Um, I think, 
you know, for, for whatever people, you know, might say online, right, reviews are supposed to be more objective, which, you know, there's no real, real objectivity uh, in, in playing games, right? Everybody brings their own personal experience to something. Um, but like video essays are more expected for, for people to bring in their own personal interest, right? You'll see that I bring up my, um, you know, former Catholicism in a lot of videos. Um, and that's because, you know, that's, that's me, that's who I am, that's my lived experience. And I hope that that, you know, makes my specific read on a piece more interesting uh, because it is coming from that perspective. And I hope that you can bring your own perspective to something as well. Um, and, you know, by, by doing that, you know, broaden the way that people think about games. Uh, so where to start, right? Well, the first thing is to uh, study other people, right? Uh, you know, I, I'm i certainly trying to ape the style of Jacob Geller, uh, who I think is probably my, my favorite video essayist, uh, who does a lot of really specific and highly researched uh, video game uh, reviews. Um, so I would definitely start um, there. But I also am really inspired by the uh, leftist YouTuber Sean, who has a really minimalist style and, and like a conversational tone. He's basically like, you know, having a conversation with you, um, just kind of having you walk through. Um, typically, he's, you know, I got into him through his like PragerU debunking videos. Um, and he's basically just like going through and being like, well, that's not really true, is it? And going through the sources of a particular video and, and kind of walking you through. But Sean has a very like limited style. It's basically just a lot of, you know, static images on a screen. Uh, and I think that's great because it's, um, you know, it, it's not a whole lot of video um, editing, but it is a lot of like uh, content. Um, you know, you're you're actually exposed to a lot of um, ideas, and it, it makes you feel very comfortable when you're when you're listening to a Sean video. Uh, Philosophy Tube, uh, obviously, Abigail Thorne has some really interesting and, and theatrical works. Um, I actually learned about Hades Town because she did a video uh, about you know comparing fascism to Hades Town and you know the the song Why We Build the Wall. Um, so a really f a fascinating uh, uh, creator, uh, Abigail. Um, there's Noah Cowell Gervais, uh, who, again, if, if is a video game, uh, you know, essayist. But I think he has an interesting style in that they're always very long and very opinionated. Um, but they often also don't match up the as far as like the, the visuals go. You know, it, it's a lot of just like gameplay footage, which I think is great because it then allows you to... Um, you know, focus more on what he's saying and bringing his, you know, uh, analytical lens to the game, which is really, really exciting. And lastly, and one that I really want to hit on is uh, the Tarnished Archaeologist, who I, I got into, you know, earlier this year, um, because they are basically like doing Elden Ring lore videos. And, you know, Elden Ring lore videos are a huge industry on YouTube. But specifically, uh, Tarnished Archaeologist is bringing like real world archaeological discoveries, like a lot of like, um, you know, like Byzantine Empire, um, uh, you know, comparing uh, the architecture of Elden Ring to um, that that historical era. Um, and I think that's like what makes those videos especially interesting. Um, and I would love to see, I, I bring in Tarnished Archaeologists because like, I would love to see even like more lore videos based on indie RPGs. You know, Dragon Kid 11 does a lot with, um, I want to say Lancer, right? And, and doing Lancer lore videos and talking about that. Um, but I would love to see even smaller games get featured like that. Um, I called Dibs on Spencer Campbell, um, but like other, other games, um, I, I think would be really, really well served if somebody was just like, hey, let's just do, just do a deep dive into all the weird, interesting uh, secrets that that a particular game designer is um, is working with. Um, so when you're thinking about making an essay, you're gonna kind of want to start with a game. Uh, you don't always have to start with a game. You know, sometimes you'll you'll pick an idea uh, and then pick a games that uh, intersect with that idea. But uh, I, I would recommend if you're doing you know like a 101 level video essay that you pick a game that um, you know about that uh, you will enjoy talking about. Um, you know, my personal preference is to go to itch.io and just go to their physical game section and just get lost in it. Um, but there's also, you know, places like Drive Through RPG, or even if you've got a local game store that has little in an indie section, just go flip through that and be like, oh, okay, you know, that's where I would find a game. Um, you know, also if you're on Tumblr, uh, Mint does the, um, there's a TTRPG for that blog, which I think is really exciting. Um, so please go ahead and check that out as well. Um, I also personally prefer electronic copies uh, for for the purposes of making videos. Um, I know that some people are more than happy to like do, um, you know, like video overviews, like having a camera over a text. But I personally think that is, um, it's a little bit harder to work with, so I prefer PDFs. Um, and also something that I think you should consider, um, the smaller the game that you're talking about, the greater the impact your work will have. And what I mean by that is like, again, 
the indie RPG scene is very um, diverse and very small and, and fragmented, right? Um, and in that way, when you're talking about a game that has maybe 100 players, um, that's going to make those 100 players super, super excited, right? You know, um, again, much love to Dragon Kid, but Lancer is a huge game, you know, that I don't feel personally the need to talk about because, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that are already playing Lancer and know about Lancer. But I think that if you focus on smaller games, you're going to get more people exposed to, to something really interesting that, um, you know, would otherwise not have as big of an audience. Um, you know, again... The most important thing is to focus on what you are personally interested in, uh, but keep this in mind going forward. Um, another way to uh, find specifically games on Itch.io is to search through tags. Um, and that's uh, kind of complicated because Itch.io is, as much as I love it, not a very useful site for actually finding stuff. Um, so one way that I've found to narrow down some of the 50,000 games that are on Itch.io um, is by going to the physical games tag um, and then adding a tag, a dash, and then putting in a subject matter. So I've got some uh, links here. Um, as you can see, there's like one to narrow down all the games that have been tagged world building. And then there's another one that's uh, to work with all the games that have been tagged POC made. Um, and those are just kind of ways to, you know, help find out games that are that are identified by their creators as that, right? So a lot of my games are tagged POC made because I'm a person of color. Um, but like, if you're trying to specifically find stuff like history or fantasy, right, or even using a specific SRD, like, um, you know, Wretched and Alone or W and A, right, uh, you're going to have to kind of experiment to work through those tags, but eventually you're going to find something that I think will uh, make sense and, and kind of filter out some of the games that, that you're not super interested in. Okay, so you've got a game, you've got kind of an idea uh, brewing in your head, and you want to talk about this game. Uh, where do you start with the script? Um, you know, I, like I said before, you start with a thesis, right? So Mouse Raider is about the terror being small. Uh, I did another one about Merkborg and how that layout is intentionally obtuse. And that's kind of, you know, it fits into the theme of the game. Uh, it's a game that hates you. And so it's uh, layout um, also hates you. Uh, and then, of course, my best RPG video um, essay ever, um, probably the greatest video essay ever, which is the We Are But Worms essay. Um, you know, again, kind of a joke, but like trying to say, hey, this is how you should read Shakespeare's Hamlet is through the text of We Are But Worms, right? You know, if you can narrow it down to, a, uh, you know, a short, concise statement about what you're trying to accomplish with that video, uh, it's going to be a lot easier for you to achieve, um, you know, a, a narrow and focused um you know, script uh, that you can deliver your ideas through. Um, that's why I would also recommend you set an estimated word count. Um, you know, I typically aim for something between like 1,200 and 1,800 words. Sometimes things kind of balloon out of uh, proportion. Um, and, and unfortunately, uh, videos that are longer are get prioritized on YouTube. YouTube is really into getting a higher um, watch count. So, you know, take that into account. Uh, but at, at least in the beginning, I'd recommend you you kind of aim for a short like you know, five to 10 minute video, right? Um, don't don't kill yourself doing this. Uh, video editing is already a lot of work. Um, you know, start small and then get bigger as you build up your tolerance to it. Uh, once you kind of have that uh, scaffolding uh, set out, you know, you have an idea, you've gotten about how many words you want to write for it. Uh, I usually make an outline, which, you know, you know, it's basic, but I really truly just do intro body conclusion. You know, I say, hey, here's what I want to talk about today. In the body, I talk about it, and in the conclusion, I kind of wrap back around to that initial idea. And that's fine, you know, as a place to start. Um, as you get better as a writer and, and a script writer, um, I think that you're going to try to stray away from that that uh, layout and that construction, which is great. Um, but, you know, at least in the initial portion, you know, try this, see how it feels. Uh, eventually, once you get uh, more confident, you can start doing experimental weird shit, um, which will be very cool. Um, when I'm thinking about trying to find interesting reads on a game, I, I have a list of questions and lenses that I try to bring. So, you know, I, I think about, like, what do I personally find interesting in a particular text? Um, so for a recent video on Creatures of Ruin, uh, I thought it was really interesting that that game's concept of immortality um, juxtaposed with the way that... Um, people people live in this, like, post-apocalyptic setting and, and trying to figure out, like, the ways in which... Um, you know, the, the setting supported that idea of immortality and what happens after, you know, humanity leaves its current era. Um, you know, what are the game's themes? Again, right, thinking about uh, immortal crabs, 
uh, and the concept of like living on forever. I thought that was really interesting. So that's, you know, tying those themes together and highlighting those. Uh, how do a game's mechan mechanics achieve its goals? Um, those are a little bit trickier, uh, but again, I, I usually will read through a game. I'll say, okay, well, maybe this mechanic is allowed to do um, this thing. This, therefore, that is an incentive, um, you know, like to go with the basic, um, you know, answer Dungeons and Dragons. When you kill a creature, you gain experience. Uh, when you, you get a certain amount of experience, you get stronger. That allows you to kill more things, right? That's the core gameplay loop. Therefore, it is, you know, uh, a fair read in my opinion to say that Dungeons and Dragons is a game that incentivizes you to kill monsters, right? Um, I don't think that's unfair to say. Um, what actions is the game most interested in and ask you to do the most? Kind of the same thing, right? Um, if the game is a game like uh, dialect where it's constantly having you talk about uh, various you know languages and playing with languages and creating new words, that's kind of what the game is about. It's interested in how language change and evolve changes and evolves over time. Um, you know, what is it trying to accomplish? You know, is this game actually, you know, a fantasy role-playing game where you feel like a hero? Or is it a game where you are mostly, um, you know, doing something else? Um, you know, this is, again, criticism of Dungeons & Dragons, like, but, like, if you're playing D&D &D and you're not actually um, doing a lot of fighting, but you're doing a lot of role-play, well, you know, that the game's not really built for that. So, you know, maybe consider playing a different game that works better with the, the thing that you are trying to accomplish when you're playing, um, because the game seems to be trying to accomplish something else with its mechanics. Uh, and then does it succeed? You know, again, trying to figure out whether or not the, the stated goals of the game, which oftentimes, especially in indie games, uh, Aaron King is really great about saying, hey, this is what I want my game to make you feel like. Um, and then when you play it and when you read it, you know, you can make that evaluation. Does it actually succeed on that? I also think there's some interesting frameworks that, that you can bring when you're first uh, first trying to write about a subject. You know, I uh, this is something that I've also broken and, and stolen from, from Jacob Geller, but basically, um, you know, firstly, summary, what is in the text? That's basically like, hey, here's here's what the game is doing. You know, here are here's a straightforward description of the mechanics. Here's, you know, excerpts from the text. Um, here is, you know, the layout of what the text and what it is, you know, the actual just telling the audience what is happening, what's going on. Um, you know, un unfortunately, you're going to have to do a lot of that unless you're assuming that your audience is already very familiar with your text. Um, so again, depend on depending on who you think you're talking to, um, you know, you may will have to do a lot of summarizing and, and that's okay. Uh, opinion, you know, this is getting a little bit more into analysis. It's, it's what you feel about the text. Um, so if I'm reading a game like, uh, let's go back to Mouse Ritter, um, you know, I, I think that Mouse Ritter is a very bare bones OSR game. However, I, I like that the way that the game encourages you to deal with being a small little mouse in its big, um, you know, setting makes you feel how impactful and scary it is um, when you're like a little small guy. Um, comparison, that's where you bring in additional texts and works. Uh, again, to go back to Mouse Ritter, that's where I bring in Secret of Nim or Redwall to be like, okay, Mouse Ritter is doing the same thing that Secret of Nim and Redwall are because those games are um, games and um, be not those games, but those texts are ones in which little heroic mice deal with big you know, animals that, that are very much bigger and scarier than them. Uh, and in perspective is another just like bringing in your own personal... Um, beliefs, opinions, and experiences to create a specific read on a text that you hope will make people feel like, oh, okay, I'm seeing what this creator is trying to say, you know, by setting up their own personal experience and relating it to this this vibe or this, um, you know, feeling in the text. I think that's great. Um, and then, you know, an additional thing is context and development, you know, what was happening during the, the text creation, you know, what happened to affect its production, right? This this is something that I think a lot, like, in movies and video games, uh, famously Fallout, um, New Vegas was made in, made in something like 18 months, like a, you know, ridiculous turnaround time, right? So you can think about how, you know, having that, you know, very short um, production time might have affected the game. Uh, on the subject of, of other writing advice, um... I don't know. I've been trying to be a writer since 2017 and very little writing advice I've found to be helpful besides you should probably write often if you're trying to be a good writer, write often and read often. Um, you know, I personally try to do about 500 words a day or about 3000 words a week. Um, you know, based on the week that I'm doing this, I, I'm going to tell you have not written 500 words per day this week. Um, 
but you know i'm still trying to to have a regular practice because that that helps me get stuff done uh i will use the forest app to just kind of like you know give myself a half hour away from my phone um and and try to churn those words out um and if i and i can find i can usually do that in about an hour you know two half hour blocks is usually enough to get me to 500 words um Another thing that I recommend you do is just, you know, read other people's stuff, right? That's that's kind of why I recommend you start small on and focus on one game. But once you start building up and reading more and more games, you can start bringing in that additional context and um, you'll have a much more informed and um, broad view of what the, you know, scene looks like right now. Um, but I highly recommend Rascal News. You know, that's probably my favorite, um, you know, tabletop outlet right now um, because they are doing like interesting and um, informed takes on games. Um, there's also Remap Radio, which is a video game uh, out and podcast, but that's another you know, group of critics that's are uh, that are making interesting uh, comparisons and reads on various texts. Um, and then, and truly, just like if you read uh, a review of a game or a movie that you're interested in, and see how the you know critic is trying to pick it apart, you know, and go back to those lenses that I showed you before the frameworks. You know, they're gonna do be doing elements of this too. You know, they're gonna be summarizing, they're gonna be giving their opinions, uh, things like that. And that's how you can kind of figure out like, okay, uh, I think this critic is doing something interesting here, but I think, you know, they're they're doing too much summary or like, oh, I think their opinion is wrong, right? And then from there you can start to build out uh what you think is is useful. Uh, additional sources. I like to use a lot of research papers um, when to supplement my text. You know, sometimes when I'm at like the 800 uh, word mark and I'm like, this text needs to be longer because otherwise I'm just doing summary. I will bring in stuff from Google Scholar, um, from JSTOR uh, and be like, okay, somebody else has written about this. Let me bring in and, and show the audience what they've said. And um, hopefully that can help build my analysis and, and um, opinion out by citing this other previous work. Um, you know, you can also, you, there's a lot of people that have done RPG blogs. Um, those are a little bit harder to search through, but uh, there's a spreadsheet of RPG bloggers that I have um, that I've linked here. Um, and I'll probably put in the video description as well. Uh, but I would highly recommend that you uh, check some of those people out, especially people like uh, Prismatic Wasteland, ZXU, Rise Up Comus, J Dragon. J Dragon in particular, I think, is, is one of my favorite RPG theorists. Um, there, there's a ton of other people um, on that list, uh, but just reading through what they've written um, is, is a really great way to be like, oh, okay, other people have really interesting ideas about how games are constructed and run. Uh, other places to get texts, uh, if you're your local library, um, you'll probably be able to get a lot of books and you know maybe even some research papers from your local library. Highly recommend getting a library card. Um, the vast majority of books that I've used as comparative texts on my channel i first checked out at the library and got an audiobook for uh and later came back to try to get like um you know check out the book um in you know physical or or ebook format to take my little screenshots um if you are you know, happen to be in in a university or if you are a staff member at that university you are set up for life uh or four years or however long you're there uh, because having access to uh, a university library will give you just a great range of um you know, sources that that you're just not going to be able to access for free on Google Scholar. Um, highly recommend you check those out as well. Uh, and then books. You know, g generally, I think it's cool if you bring in books as a as a way to supplement your text. Um, again, reading takes a long time, and it's it's it is hard to do. It is very time consuming, but I think it's absolutely worth it when you can bring in a book and say, "Hey, actually, this book, you know, whether that's a, a nonfiction or a fiction book, you know, has an interesting and related read to this game I'm talking about." Um, okay, congrats! You're done with your script. You've you've written out your your twelve hundred to fifteen hundred word script. You think it's pretty solid. Um, now, what do you do? Well. You got to talk it to a microphone, unfortunately. Um, and I'll tell you what I do, um, which is, you know, for for what I do is I, I go to Audacity and I use that because it is free. Uh, I basically try to spend the least amount of money uh, at all times on my work. Sometimes that, that doesn't pay out. Sometimes I have, sometimes I have to buy books or, um, you know, buy rent movies, whatever. Um that's unfortunate, but uh, I, I highly recommend using free software just because this is, you know, we're doing this for fun. Um, so Audacity is my number one go-to to just have some something to, to get audio into. It's really easy to, you know, save as different file types. And, um, you know, you can get really into Audacity if you're that kind of person. I'm not. I just use it for basic stuff, but I would start there. Um, you need a microphone. 
Again, do not spend a whole lot of money on this. If you have a USB microphone, that's probably fine. Um, you know, I personally use the Audio Technica AT uh, 2005. That's a USB microphone. Uh, now I only got that because uh, Jeff Stormer recommended that, um, and it, it's a great microphone. Um, and, I, and honestly, I wasn't even able to do that without the support of my my um, you know some some good people on um, on Ko-Fi, which includes uh, Pandian Games and uh, uh, Josh Peters. So shout outs to you all. Um, anyway, like if you have a microphone, um, you know, basically as long as it's, you know, even if it's a webcam microphone, I would recommend not getting a webcam microphone because those usually aren't very good. Um, but even if it's like completely fine, even if it's you recording into your, um, you know, like your Apple headphones with the little mic on the, the thing, that's probably good enough. Um, again, don't spend a lot of money on this. It's, we're just having fun here. Um, you also need a way to read your script while talking into that microphone. Um, I usually, I have a dual monitor setup, so I have my um, script on in front of me, and I'm reading into the microphone, and then my Audacity is on the other screen, so I can pause and re-record and, um, you know, keep keep editing my, my stumblings as I go forward. Um, you know, some people do paper, some people would um, might read it out on their phone, you know, it's truly just whatever works for you. Uh, I recommend you have a relatively quiet place to record. Um, for podcasters, you know, the, it is always recommended to do like a, a closet full of clothes cause that has a real, um, you know, sound dampening effect. Um, but even if you're doing something where like you, you live in an apartment and you can just kind of put a couple pillows up around behind your screens on the computers, um, that's going to help reduce a little bit of that echo. Um, you know, right now, uh, my, my wife is out and, you know, I, I've stopped the laundry and that's what I'm recording with right now. It's just like, it's quiet enough. And that's honestly fine. Um, but the, the hardest part for me is, is patience, right? I stumble over my words a lot. Um, I, you could probably hear in some of my videos where I will make a misstep. I will say something wrong. Um, I don't always, uh, re-record those. I don't always, uh, catch the ones that I've missed, right? Um, and that's, that's a real pain to do. I, I think it's very frustrating, but, um, you know, just have patience with it. You're not going to be good at it the first time and that's okay. Um, you just got to keep trying at it. Um, and, you know, Honestly, no one's going to care if um, you have a couple missteps in your in your speech. Um, Noah Cowell Gervais um, is one of those people who, you know, has has very long uh, videos. And, you know, sometimes he stumbles and that's totally fine. He, he doesn't take them out. He just keeps going. And, you know, I've never gone into his comments and seen somebody being like, oh, you actually said this. And if if you do get those people, you should just block them because they're super annoying. Uh, once you've got an audio file, I recommend you use the program Levelator. Um, I've included a link there, um, but it helps just make sure that your audio is at a consistent volume. That way it's not going to be competing with other elements of your video. Um, so I would save your uh, audio file not as an MP3, but as a WAV. Um, and once you do that, you can import that into Levelator. Uh, it'll basically take that file that you've put in and um, create a dot .output file. Um, and once that output file um, is complete, that'll kind of have a basic file that is that is leveled out. Your audio will be at a consistent volume, um, and then you will import that into your video editing program. That will be kind of the backbone that you base your video off of. Video editing. Um, I hate video editing. It sucks. It sucks so bad. <laughs> um, there's there's no getting around it. Uh, but I, I think it is worth it in the end. But it, it is a lot of work, unfortunately. Um, again, I use DaVinci Resolve uh, because it's free. If you have a better software, by all means, go ahead and use it. But I'm just using you know, the cheapest one available. Um, I watched a couple of YouTube tutorials and, and meddled around with it. But truly, you know, it's completely fine if you're just clicking and dragging things onto a timeline um, and, and you know, going from there, right? Uh, I highly recommend you know, using any sort of program that has a lot of YouTube support. Uh, if there is a creator community out there, because that's where I get 99% of my information from is just going to a YouTube video and being like, okay, how do I select all of these things? Um, and usually I can find that within minutes. Um, but yeah, once you've got your, your video program set up, uh, you will import that audio file, that dot, you know, wav, um, dot output file that you levelated. Um, and I use that as the baseline for my video. I basically just start clicking and dragging uh, various media clips over my my speech um, to to perform, you know, to find the like um, the core text of the. No, that's not really what I'm trying to say. Um, 
to to basically match the the sentences in my video to uh, a, a piece of media. Um, collecting video media is basically finding that media that you're going to put on screen while you're talking. Um, it's you know you don't always have to do this. Um, I think there's a creator uh, Rosenkreutz who does a lot of like um, paradox games, um, and he you know sometimes he he has like just very basic like texts on screens or like you know screenshots um, and you know gameplay footage. Right, it doesn't always have to match. You know, again, uh, I recommend lower effort because um, you know that's going to be you know the the whatever is easiest for you is the thing that you're going to want to do and, and want to keep making these videos. So again, don't kill yourself with this. Um, but usually basically what I'll do is I'll go through my script. Uh, I'll select a portion, which is usually about, you know, a sentence long, maybe half a sentence. If, if I change top topics or subjects, you know, halfway through the sentence, um, and I'll leave a number, I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, the, but then I will find a video or a photo or something that corresponds with that portion of the script. And I will, you know, save that video file as that number. So that way, when I come back, I will say, okay, I'm on number you know, I'm on line one of my script. I have video file number one here. I'm going to import that into my uh, video. And um, through that way, I'm going to you know, continue to build my, my video timeline out. Um, I'm just going to, and then I just do that a million times. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no, there's no better. I, listen, there's probably a better option, um, but I haven't found that yet. So if you have a better process, please let me know. Um, cause it's, it's, a, it's a tedious, unfortunately, but I think this is the most efficient way for me to get through my script, uh, and have that built out, uh, in a way that, that I feel satisfied with. Um, I highly recommend reusing the same media. So if you can download or, or screen grab like a whole, um, you know, a gameplay trailer for a video game, uh, for instance, and then use different parts of those, that trailer, um, in your video, I highly recommend that because that's just going to save you some time, uh, collecting video media. Uh, but basically, once you have all that together and saved and, and numbered, uh, I just import that media into DaVinci Resolve, uh, and then I and I start kind of assembling them like little uh, Lego bricks. Um, this is the example of what I'm talking about. So you can see here from my latest video, um, I've got an example of like, okay, I've assigned a number three to this sentence. Um, so I'm going to save a, a clip as three, and then I'm going to import it into my timeline. And then just click and drag uh, to correspond with the audio portion um, of my timeline that that matches up with the sentence, and um, you know just go from there and just keep doing it. Uh, collecting media, you know, there's a lot of ways to find media. Um, there's a lot of free photo and stock video sites. Uh, my primary one is Pexels because they have really great quality videos um, that that kind of help um, provide visual interest, right? Uh, I started by only using uh, JPEGs and PNGs, but I switched over to to having more videos because I I got more into it and, and felt that 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 was a worth the time investment. Uh, so you know, recommend Pexels definitely, but also Unsplash. That's a lot of great stock videos, uh, or not videos, but that Unsplash is specifically pictures. Um, Pixabay also has videos, but Pixabay is great for also having music. Uh, that's that's probably my my number one for getting music. Um, if you're also going to add music, there's the free music archive. Um, some of those have various requirements and restrictions for um, what music you can use, so make sure you check those out. Um, there's also the internet archive, which has a lot of great audio um, uh, resources there. And then also Humble Bundles. Occasionally, Humble will create like a, a big bundle of various music. Um, so I bought this bundle recently, the one that's on screen here, uh, but it was like 25 bucks for like, you know, like seven or, or 10 different, just like bricks of various, um, game musics that you'll occasionally see in my videos going forward. Um, it's just like to have that, that base of music is kind of nice. That way you don't have to go trawling through all these sites. Um, another way that I get, uh, media is through YouTube videos. Um, you know, uh, I think there's probably some, uh, ethical dilemma to, to taking videos that have already been uploaded to YouTube. Um, and you can make that decision for your own. But what I typically try to do is, um, you know, if it's an advertisement or a game trailer, I think that's completely fine to use. Um, whenever I've used them, YouTube does not flag them in any way. Um, especially if they're from like a big company, I think that's completely fine to, to repurpose. Um, they're, they're made to be seen. Um, sometimes though, smaller creators will, you know, upload full excerpts from a various movie or a video. 
um, and you can certainly pull those in. Uh, YouTube doesn't love that, and sometimes you may get demonetized, um, but honestly, I wouldn't worry about getting demonetized for the first couple of years of your channel unless you hit it big, in which case, congrats. Um, but like, uh, yeah, like I, I usually will, if there is like an excerpt, excerpt from a video or a movie, I will probably sort or uh, cite the source where, where that comes from, and, and that's either citing the, the movie uh, itself or the the video creator um you know it's kind of a, a gray area because they're probably not supposed to be uploading you know big portions of videos to youtube either but you know um i'm not going to snitch on them um gameplay footage is a little bit different because that's going to be somebody actually recording their own footage from games and uploading that to youtube um you know i think typically that that's okay to use and you know unless they've explicitly said hey don't use my gameplay footage in in whatever other youtube products you're making um i would just make sure to cite that source and put that source on screen while you're playing it um yeah and just in general right if you're using footage from another creator who is not like you know a company you know i'd recommend you you cite that on the screen um, i mostly use um like the the like screenshot snipping tool when i'm getting my uh videos uh, you know, right now it's highlighted on the screen as the like screenshot version, but if you switch over and click that camera on the right side, it'll, it'll let you record, uh, directly from, from the, the video itself. That's honestly just the, the fastest way that I found to do it. I used to do YouTube to MP4 converters, but uh, unfortunately YouTube has been cracking down on those a lot. So those are kind of unreliable. Uh, so, you know, do what you can, but that's the, the fastest way that I've been able to capture video footage. Um, another way to make sure that a creator is actually okay with you using their work is if you're going to YouTube, you can type, uh, you know, a subject in the, the search bar and you can go over to the right where it'll say filters. You click on the filters uh, and then it'll give you this list, one of which will be Creative Commons. Uh, and if you click on Creative Commons, that'll sort by all of the videos that are, you know, opened up to Creative Commons permissions. Um, I try to make sure that all of my videos uh, are Creative Commons in that way so that people feel free to, you know, take my videos uh, and, you know, you know, import them into their own works if that's something that they'd be interested in doing. Um, if you're going to do, uh, if you're going to use somebody else's work, um, I basically recommend using on-screen citations. Again, I didn't start doing this until that big um, H Bomber guy video from last year uh, about plagiarism came up. Um, and, you know, I think he makes a pretty good point that we want to try to avoid plagiarism where possible on YouTube. So uh, I keep a master list of all, all where I get all of my footage, um, um, my non-stock footage, to be clear. Um, a lot of my, my footage is, is from sites like uh, Pexels or, or Unsplash or Pixabay. Uh, but if I know I'm taking it from somebody else on YouTube, I will make a, a list uh, and make sure that that's uh, something that I can bring up if somebody's asking about it. Um, and then typically, I'll just say like, hey, if I'm going to play a song, it's the song by the name of the artist for the video. I'm usually going to put the, the name of the channel and then title of the video. Um, and then if I like am citing a research paper or a blog post, I'll probably put that like citation on the screen somewhere. Uh, you know, when it comes up, um, I will link that in my uh, transcript. I don't have that transcript specifically in this PowerPoint, um, but I also recommend that you you put a transcript of your your script that, that you're reading off of somewhere on on the internet, whether that's a um, you know a Ko-fi or a personal blog or even a Google um, Doc. You know, just something so that if people just want to read through what you're saying, uh, they can have access to that. And that's a great place to to put a link to the sources that you're using. Um, yeah, but once you've, uh, you know, did all, did all of that hard work, uh, you export your video, you upload it to YouTube using uh, YouTube Studio. It's, uh, you know, a little bit of a process, but once you do that... Um, you know, you've got a video up on YouTube. Congratulations. Uh, I would recommend that you post that video in a game's itch.io comments. Uh, itch.io likes when video comments are, are added to a various games. Um, you know, itch.io, itch.io will boost a game if there's a video comment in, um, in its comment section, basically. I don't know why. It just likes doing that. Um, so that's a good way to help uh, game designers get a little bit more um, visibility. Uh, I'd also recommend that you post on your post personal social media and tag the creators if you're saying something nice about them. Um, I didn't tag uh, Sean Tompkin in my video on Ironsworn because, uh, you know, it's not a bad video on Ironsworn. I'm not saying Ironsworn sucks, but it is, you know, I, I am taking issue with a certain mechanic. So I didn't ta tag Sean, uh, uh, you know, no hard feelings. Um, but in general, if you're, if you're, you want those creators to see that you put effort into talking about their work, um, that's always a nice thing to do. And I think they would appreciate that as long as you are, you know, polite about it. 
Uh, and lastly, you know, engage with the people in your comment section. You know, I, I don't get a whole lot of comments. You know, usually it's it's less than, you know, five comments per video. But still, it's nice to let people know that if, if they want to say something in, in to you, to your video, to talk about it, um, you know, go ahead and reply to them. You know, it shows um, them that you are interested and engaged with whatever audience you're making. Um, and it, YouTube also likes when there's a lot of comments in videos. Again, I don't think, um, I certainly don't work in the realm where, you know, having an additional couple comments in my sections is going to increase my visibility in any meaningful way. Um, so I, I think it's just a nice way to build your little community out. Um, and then just like, also I have no patience for people being, you know, rude in my comment section. So, uh, there's a way to, if somebody leaves a rude comment on you, um, hide them forever from your channel, which I highly recommend doing. Um, some other last minute tips, uh, I, I, I personally care way more about the quality of your writing than your production value. Uh, like I said about Sean earlier, if you're just doing like a slideshow, but you've got a lot of really interesting things to say, I think that's great. Uh, I would honestly encourage you to start there because that's going to be a way easier um, on you personally. You know, like I, I think maybe a third of people in my channel are actually watching them like sitting down at a computer or a phone or watching it versus just like listening while they're doing chores because that's what I do. I, I very rarely will sit down and watch a YouTube video. I'm mostly listening to it while I'm doing like, you know, the dishes or something. Um, also, you know, video editing will get easier over time, but it's truly not the most important thing. Like the vast majority of people are, are not going to be super upset because you're not using like flashy transitions or whatever. Um, just a general tip that YouTube Studio is kind of a pain. It, it's useful to have, but don't obsess over its analytics. I, you know, we're we're not working at the numbers where that those analytics are going to be really meaningful to you. Um, you know, eventually you'll be able to see like spikes and and dips in in your you know views over time. But I wouldn't recommend caring about that. You know, uh, I I just try to imagine who my audience is and, and make videos for them specifically, um, and then whoever else comes in, that's great for them. And then, yeah, uh, talk about stuff you care about. Um, I think that being specific about your your tastes and your interests are is way more um, engaging, and and you're going to have a better product than trying to shoot for something that's general. Um, you know, I think there's plenty of D and D creators out there that are talking about you know very generic D and D things. I think that in the indie RPG space, we can drill down and do something really interesting by targeting small games with small weird idiosyncrasies, and um, you know. I think I think that's going to be a, a more uh, fruitful outcome in the long run. So yeah, that's my uh, little primer. Uh, if you've got any questions, go ahead and drop them in the comments and I will help if I can. Um, you can also reach out to me at avoid.beastguy.social. Um, but yeah, you know, if, if you have any interest in making video essays for RPGs, uh, again, I really, really hope that you do make them because um, I think they're really fun. Uh, it, it is sort of like doing a solo playthrough of a game in, in a way. So I hope that, you know, if you have any questions, please, please leave them in the comments. But I really hope that this, this uh, little primer inspires you to make your own video essays. Thanks.